So welcome back to Nutrients Involved in Bone Health. This is part two, and we're going to start talking about magnesium and its functions in the body and why we need it for nutrition. So magnesium, along with calcium and phosphorus, is going to assist in keeping the bones nice and rigid and strong. And 60% of the body's magnesium is actually stored in our bone. But magnesium is very important. It also helps in uh, nerve conduction. It helps in uh, conduction of the heart. Magnesium is necessary for muscles to be able to uh, contract and to relax. Uh, it is also really necessary for ATP production as well. It helps in over 300 enzymatic reactions, and that is uh, helping in the enzymes also that make ATP. So if you don't have enough magnesium in your body, uh, you may be very tired all the time. Magnesium increases resistance to tooth decay because it helps to stabilize calcium in the tooth and make the tooth nice and strong and to prevent attack by bacteria. Uh, we talked about it's required for ATP production and it's required for synthesis of vitamin D in our liver as well. And it lowers our risk of type 2 diabetes. So what magnesium does for us as far as diabetes is concerned is it lowers our uh, insulin resistance issues. So a lot of people have... Um, they have problems with the ability for their receptors to bind to insulin. And basically insulin resistance, again, in a nutshell, is down regulation of those receptors. So we have been uh, put in a situation in our body where there's too much sugar all the time, too many carbohydrates binding to these receptors, or excuse me, uh, too many carbohydrates in the blood, and so then there's too much insulin binding to these receptors, and because of the excess insulin, our receptors are going to downregulate, which means they're going to pull into the cells. Well, magnesium has been shown to play a role in keeping those receptors from downregulating and preventing insulin resistance in the body. Uh, magnesium is also important to allow arteries to main, re, remain excuse me, dilated so that it helps to decrease blood pressure issues. So to make sure we get enough insulin, the recommended daily allowance is 400 milligrams for men, 310 milligrams for women. The average U.S. consumption is less than that, and so it's recommended we increase our consumption of magnesium-rich foods. Um, refining grains reduces magnesium content by as much as 80%. So um, it is recommended that you eat the whole grains instead. So if you hear any caw, caw sounds, those are just my peacocks going crazy today. So sorry about that. Magnesium deficiency can cause irregular heartbeat, uh, it can cause muscle weakness and pain, disorientation, seizures, and like I said already, it can also decrease your energy level, uh, bone strength, and that bone density goes down. Uh, also, if um, a person is still developing their bones at a younger age, poor bone development can occur and you don't have as much bone formation. Now, alcoholism increases our risk of magnesium deficiency because, again, uh, people who are alcoholics typically do more drinking of the alcohol than they do of eating nu nutrients. Now, also, one other thing, too, with alcoholism is you have an increased excretion of magnesium through the urine as well. So magnesium absorption, um, a high phosphorus diet is going to decrease our ability to absorb magnesium. So those cola sodas that a lot of people drink way too much of uh, are going to cause problems with that. Also high fiber uh, will reduce magnesium absorption. Low protein diets do the same thing. And magnesium loss uh, can happen because of heavy perspiration, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, diuretics, and then of course alcohol abuse.
So some of the food sources of magnesium, uh, it's found in chlorophyll, so those deep green leafy vegetables. Also the whole grains we talked about, nuts, beans, seeds, broccoli, squash, animal products such as milk and meats and chocolate. Nice. Uh, hard tap water. Hard means that there are a lot of minerals in that tap water. Coffee in espresso uh, that's not brewed. So this just again shows you some sources of magnesium. So if you look here, spinach, uh, very good source for magnesium. And then raisin bran, hmm, maybe I need to start eating some raisin bran every morning. Seems like a good source of a lot of different things. Uh, yogurt and soy milk, peanut butter, navy beans, all excellent sources of magnesium. Now some people will take magnesium in a supplement form, uh, but some people have a hard time with magnesium because magnesium uh, can cause diarrhea and really bad diarrhea. So others, instead of taking it uh, by mouth as a supplement, will actually get an oil of magnesium and rub that on the arms or on the stomach and um, they don't seem to have as much of a risk of diarrhea with that. So the upper limit is 300 milligrams per day, and like I said, excess can cause diarrhea. Non-food sources can cause problems. Dietary sources are rarely problematic, so you have to be very careful with the magnesium oil. Toxicity can occur uh, in people who have kidney failure and over-the-counter laxatives and antacids can be a problem because they quite often contain magnesium and so you may end up having too much uh, magnesium in a day. The elderly are at increased risk of magnesium uh, toxicity and functions of fluoride. So in the early 1900s some dentists noticed that um, people who had a higher intake of fluoride actually had a lower rate of dental caries, what we call cavities, in the southwestern United States because uh, in the southwestern United States there's a lot of fluoride already in the water. And so what they decided to do was the United States decided to add fluoride to the water to help to prevent dental cavities and to keep teeth nice and strong. Now, of course, there's a lot of people who say that the excess fluoride in the water is uh, a way to decrease mental capacity in people as well. Uh, and so they uh, will use non-fluoridated uh, toothpaste. And so um, not only did we put fluoride in water, but we also added fluoride into the toothpaste. And this fluoride seems to stimulate remineralization of the enamel uh, and to help the enamel to resist the acid that bacteria in our mouth normally make. So we have bacteria that live in our mouth all the time and those bacteria eat the foods that we eat and then those bacteria secrete acid. And that acid is what actually erodes the enamel on the outside of our teeth. So making sure we get enough fluoride, uh, it is recommended to have 3.1 to 3.8 milligrams per day and one cup of fluoridated water is 0.25 milligrams per cup. And again, prevents dental caries, doesn't seem to increase risk of illness. Um, if you're putting a filter on your water, the filters do not remove fluoride. So sources of fluoride in our food would be like uh, marine fish, so also clams, lobster, shrimp, tea, seaweed, some natural water sources because those would be the hard water, and then also fluoridated water. But bottled water is not usually fluoridated. It doesn't typically have fluoride added. Avoiding too much fluoride now is important too. The upper limit for children is about 2.2 milligrams per day. Uh, 10 milligrams for people ages 9 and over, and fluorosis, which is excess intake of fluoride, uh, a lot of times uh, the only place you're really going to see this is where you have children who decide they're going to eat their toothpaste instead of just brush their teeth with it.
And now you can see in this picture, these are permanently damaged teeth from excess fluoride consumption. So they become stained and pitted. Uh, so it's recommended to tell your kids, don't swallow the toothpaste and use a little teeny tiny bit, just a little pea size amount on their toothbrush. All right, so another vitamin that's important for bone health is vitamin K, and vitamin K is also a fat-soluble vitamin. And vitamin K activates proteins that are present in your bones, your muscles, your kidneys, and vitamin K imparts calcium binding potential to these organs. So it allows calcium to be absorbed into those organs and to do its chemical job. Uh, chemically modifies the protein called osteocalcin, which is required for calcium to be added to and removed from bone. Uh, vitamin K is one of the most abundant small, or excuse me, vitamin K activates this protein osteocalcin, which is a protein found in the matrix of the bone. And these matrix proteins are exclusively made in the matrix of the bone. Now remember that matrix is that hydroxyapatite of the bone, okay? So micronutrients that participate in the synthesis of collagen, which we talked about, is very important for bone health. Now collagen is a connective tissue that is super duper strong. And um, it's very interesting, you know, people were trying to figure out how to make the strongest rope. And one of the things they found was twisting strands of fiber together helped to strengthen rope. Now, the question was, do we twist two strands, ten strands? How many strands do we twist together to make this really strong rope? And they found that three strands twisted together makes the strongest rope. Well, collagen happens to be three strands of these fibers twisted together to make basically a collagen rope. And collagen is so strong that if you were to pull on collagen until it broke and then pull on a piece of steel the same size until it broke, the steel would break first. And so what we say is that collagen has a greater tensile strength than steel, but it's also very flexible. So collagen helps to uh, creates stability. It also creates flexibility within our bones. So vitamin C is uh, very important. It is an antioxidant, but we've talked about vitamin C already. And one of the other things that I told you is that vitamin C is necessary for connective tissue functioning, which that's our collagen we're talking about. Iron is required for bone health because iron um, is going to uh, activate enzymes, or it's a cofactor, you might say, on enzymes that convert vitamin D to its active form. And zinc is also another cofactor for enzymes in bone remodeling, and copper and silicone also contribute to collagen synthesis. Vitamin K, we talked about, it allows for calcium binding in the bones. And boron, believe it or not, something you don't really think about much, boron is very important in bone structure and strength. Boron actually uh, influences osteoblasts as well as osteoclasts and how active they are. So if you're boron deficient, uh, you may have very sluggish osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Now, remember, all of these minerals you're getting in your diet by eating plant sources mainly. You get some from animal sources, but a lot of them are plant sources. And think about this, the plants are sucking these minerals out of the ground and then incorporating those minerals into themselves, and then you're eating that plant. So it's really also very important that our soil is very mineral rich as well, which this is another nutrition issue in the United States because a lot of our farms are big business corporate farms. And soil health 
is not necessarily looked after that well. Um, there's a lot to making sure that your soil is rich and your soil is healthy and your soil contains all of the minerals that your plants need to survive, but also that we need to survive by eating those plants. And so good farming practices are super important and they're not necessarily being done all that well. And so sometimes you just wonder, is one of the reasons that people in the United States um, have health issues is because our farmers are not farming the way that we used to or farming maybe the best that we could. Just something to think about. All right, another thing about boron is it increases transport of calcium across the cell membrane. Okay, so now osteoporosis. This is porous and fragile bones due to low mineral density, not something that we want to have. It's defined, so if you're gonna be measuring osteoporosis, you're gonna look and see one of two things. Is there a stress-induced fracture present in the person? Or you're gonna be looking at what's called a T-score, which we'll, I'll explain that to you. And a T-score of 22.5 or lower indicates osteoporosis. So in 2015, now this is kind of scary to me, there were 10 million Americans over the age of 50 who had osteoporosis. Now in 2020, you're still looking at the age of over 50, there are 64 and a half million Americans who have osteoporosis. So, hmm, question is, what the heck is going on? In 2030, the estimate is 71.2 million Americans with osteoporosis. Now, this takes into account that America is getting a little bit older as well. So these are estimates concluding that we have more uh, elderly Americans, um, but they're just looking at the percentages and calculating it that way. So women tend to lose one to 3% of their bone mass each year after menopause. So menopause is the complete cessation of the menstrual cycle and um, usually you're waiting for somebody to be in menopause they haven't had a period for one year okay so after that somewhere usually about the age of 53 women have a tendency to be fully in menopause men lose bone mass as the age but it's more gradual and that's because um, of a couple of things first of all when women go through menopause, they're losing all those uh, levels of estrogen. And remember I told you that estrogen along with vitamin D is necessary in order for calcium to be absorbed from the small intestine into the bloodstream and then put into the bone. Uh, men don't have that issue. The second thing is, remember we talked about the fact that when you exercise, okay, you have bigger muscles, those muscles pull on bone, those bones get bigger. Well, men have bigger muscles to begin with, and so they're able to exercise more. Those larger muscles create more dense bone. So um, the density of a bone in a male versus the density of a bone in a female at the same age is going to be thicker in the male to begin with. So the loss for the female is going to be uh, greater because number one, her bones weren't so thick, and number two, she's lost that estrogen in comparison to men. So bone demineralization activity of osteoclasts exceeds bone building activity of osteoblasts. So bone mass is going to decline overall. So this is what you're looking at here. You're looking at, again, the cortical or uh, compact bone on the outside. This is the trabecular bone. And this is normal trabecular bone, but you can see how it breaks here. And you get these larger holes, and that makes the bone less dense and less stable. 
So osteoporosis in the United States has led to 2 million bone fractures per year, uh, 300,000 broken hips, and the medical cost is going to reach about 25 billion in 2025. Hip fractures lead to loss of mobility, loss of independence. Uh, only 40% regain their earlier independence because once that hip fractures, it's very difficult to heal. Uh, and so now this person's gonna get need increased long-term care. Um, and then it is associated with an increase in death. 20 to 30% of those who fracture a hip will die within 12 months. Now, you think, okay, how in the world does breaking my hip actually cause death? Well, uh, you're not necessarily talking about the hip bones that break here when you say that somebody has fractured their hip. Uh, a lot of times what they're actually talking about is that there's a break to the head of the femur. And the head of the femur, even uh, the hip itself, both of them are important in uh, producing red blood cells. And that production of red blood cells is going to decrease dramatically uh, when a person fractures the head of the femur or fractures their hip. And that's one of the major reasons that we see people dying from this. So this just shows some of the economic burden of osteoporosis. So here we are in 2020, and you're looking at the cost in millions here, and that is quite a lot. So probably around $22 million a year it's costing us. And then you have the majority of people who have osteoporosis are white, and then you have black, and then Hispanic, and then Asian, other individuals. Now, you also have osteopenia. So looking at the difference between osteopenia versus osteoporosis, osteopenia, the bone loss is not as severe as in osteoporosis. So someone with osteopenia is more likely to fracture a bone than someone with a normal bone density, but is less likely to fracture a bone than someone with osteoporosis. So osteopenia, your basically on your way to osteoporosis. The bone is not as thin yet. It's not quite as easy to break, but it's easier to break than if you had a normal healthy bone. Um, I've seen bones in individuals uh, who have had osteoporosis and literally you could pick up their hip bones and their see-through. And so they're so thin and so fragile, you have to wear gloves just to pick up these bones because they'll just crumble in your hand. So now imagine those in someone's body. <clears throat> Excuse me. So type 1 osteoporosis, this is postmenopausal osteoporosis. Women between the ages of 50 to 60 start to get this. It's linked to that low estrogen level, so we can't absorb the calcium. It affects the trabecular bone, and so osteoclasts Osteoclasts and osteoblasts are always working against each other. The osteoclast is trying to tear down bone, osteoblast is trying to build up bone, but now osteoclasts outweigh osteoblasts. And so remodeling is happening very rapidly and the bone is degrading because of this. And one of the reasons for that is that osteoblasts also require estrogen to help them to work at their max. Osteoclasts don't need this, and so they're still at their high activity. So type 2 osteoporosis can happen in both men and women. This is typically later in life, uh, 70, 75 plus, and you start to see not just the trabecular bone breaking down, but also that harder cortical bone. And this is a combination of diet and a combination of age-related factors. So a lot of this has to do with, number one, am I getting enough vitamin D3? And number two, am I exercising enough? Am I moving enough? And so bone loss increases because the person doesn't have enough vitamin D3. And sometimes that is because 
First of all, you can't do the conversion in the skin. Second of all, the kidneys are not functioning appropriately, and so they can't do the conversion either. And so these individuals really should be consuming more vitamin D3. Um, now, this is just some pictures of osteoporosis, but before we get there, one of the other things that's really important that we haven't talked about yet is as you age, we know that muscle and strengthening muscle helps to thicken bone. But what happens when I hit that prime age of 30 and go over the hill of 30 and I start going that downhill slide where bone is starting to demineralize, it's not actually growing and staying thick anymore. What do I do? And of course, the best thing is to make sure you have the thickest bones possible prior to hitting the age of 30. But after the age of 30, you want to continue to do exercises that are going to keep the muscles nice and strong, which also help to keep the bones strong. So again, any type of anti-gravity exercises, so push-ups, pull-ups, uh, lifting weights, uh, pushing something heavy, doing things that help to keep the muscle strength also helps to keep the bone strength. So you can see in this picture here, this is normal bone, and this is bone that's starting to do that osteopenia thing until eventually we have breakdown into osteoporosis. And then this is just a closer look at this. So not only do you have breakdown of trabecular bone, but there should be cortical bone over top of this, and it's just gone. So this is that relationship between peak bone mass and developing osteoporosis. So this is um, the age of 30. Remember we talked about that peak 30. And we have two basically different women looking at here. So let's look at woman A and look at the fact that um, she's a very active woman and she's been doing a lot of uh, exercise her whole life up until the age of 30. Uh, maybe she does gymnastics and she lifts weights in high school and she goes on to do that in college. And so you can see her bone mineral density is very, very high. We hit 30 and the bone mineral density slowly over the years starts to decline. However, even though it declines all the way to the age of 70, even to the age over 80, she never hits osteoporosis because she started out with those thicker bones. With woman number B, or letter B, um, she doesn't do quite the same thing. So she hits the age of 30, and by the time she's in her 50s, she's already starting to experience some osteoporosis. And that's because she didn't keep up that muscle mass, she didn't keep up that bone density. And this is just showing you uh, a young woman who has a nice strong spine versus an elderly woman who has now what's called kyphosis of the spine. And so you get that kind of buffalo hump at the back. One of the other problems with that is as um, her spine is starting to curve there and it's uh, sticking out at her shoulders, you notice she's also starting to hunch over. And what that does is it compresses the thoracic cavity onto the abdominal cavity and then below the pelvic cavity. So all of her internal organs over time can be very squished. She has a very difficult time breathing, those organs don't function well, and it can be very painful for the person, especially depending on how far over they begin to bend. So there are some medications, luckily, uh, nowadays for people who experience osteoporosis. Uh, biphosphonates are probably the number one medication used right now. And biphosphonate molecules attach to and enter uh, osteoclasts. And they disrupt intracellular enzymatic functions needed for bone resorption. So basically what they're doing is these biphosphonates slow down the osteoclasts because our osteoblasts have slowed down. We need to slow down the osteoclasts too so that bone resorption does not occur. 
Uh, parathyroid hormone can also be given. And then for uh, women, calcium supplements, vitamin D supplements. Now, vitamin D supplements are much more recommended than even the calcium supplements. Uh, and then the question is hormone replacement therapy. So do we give to our female patients estrogen? And this is still kind of up in the air. Uh, there are some doctors who will now say, yes, once a woman hits menopause, you can give her estrogen for five years. However, after year five, you need to cut her off. And the reason for that is because it's been shown that by supplementing with estrogen, it increases her risk of heart attack and blood clotting. Uh, some doctors will say, nope, just stop the hormone replacement therapy altogether. It's too dangerous. So just kind of depends on the doctor. All right, so some bone health assessments that we are uh, told that we need to have done as we get older, and one is a DEXA. So this is a dual energy x-ray absorptiometry, and the DEXA takes about 15 minutes, and what happens is you lay down on this big bed, and this kind of x-ray machine goes over top of you from head to toe. And the low energy x-ray is going to be blocked by the thicker bone, okay? Uh, the thinner bone, the x-ray kind of penetrates through. And then the DEXA gives you a measurement of what we call a T-score. So normal bone density is going to be from 0 to negative 1 for our T-score. Low bone density is going to be negative 1 to negative 2.4. Osteoporosis is negative 2.5 or lower. Uh, there's also what's called a frax, a fracture assessment or a fracture risk assessment tool. It's not as um, as expensive. You can do this test online. They just ask you some questions. I put the website on there, so if you wanted to go there and take a look, you could. But the DEXA is kind of the um, tool that you need to use on your patients as they get older. So the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends for the DEXA testing for women 65 and older, men 70 and older, postmenopausal women uh, ages 50 to 69 who are more at risk for osteoporosis, perimenopausal women. Now these are women uh, prior to the age of 50 but close to 50. So let's say 48, 49, okay? These are perimenopause peri meaning around the menopause age. Uh, these are women with low body weight and uh, they have uh, low trauma fractures, meaning that their bones broke and it didn't take a lot of trauma for that to happen. And then they're at higher risk because of certain medications that they take like long-term corticosteroid use uh, would be one. Uh, adults with fractures after the age of 60, adults with health conditions, we talked about on long-term steroids, and anyone uh, just considered uh, who might have osteoporosis already. Okay, so this is just showing you your T-score, and of course, um, the lower the T-score, the higher your risk is going to be uh, for poor bone health. All right, well, thank you so much for coming and listening to this lecture, and I will see you next time. Isn't that a cute Highland cow?